All righty, I think we are live now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of the Fieldhouse Museum's online speaker series. My name is Nicole, and I'm really, really uh, excited today to welcome Mike Turex from the 1904 World's Fair Society. Uh, he will be giving a presentation today. A little bit about uh, Mike and what's going on at the Fieldhouse. Right now, we currently have an exhibit um, that the Fantastic Fairs, the Fields of the World's Fair, which is in our entryway, and it showcases what roles and how Eugene and Julian interacted with the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, as well as the 1904 World's Fair here in St. Louis. And a little bit about Mike. Mike is the president of the 1904 World's Fair Society. His interest as a collector um, and enthusiast in World's Fair memorabilia began soon after he moved to St. Louis in 1989, when his great great aunt gave him a small souvenir Ruby Flash toothpick holder uh, that she had acquired at the fair. Along with writing books, Mike also gives uh, presentations about the 1904 World's Fair, which, will be, which he will be doing today. Um, and the 1904 World's Fair, uh, Fair Society was founded in 1986 and has over 250 members actively participating. If anyone has any questions during the presentations, please feel free to ask in the comment section. We will be recording them and I will be uh, relaying them to Mike at the end. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to him. Okay, thank you, Nicole. I uh, appreciate it. I'm uh, going to share my screen into my PowerPoint right now. Uh, as Nicole said, I am uh, been in the 1904 World's Fair Society since about 1997, uh, a few years after I moved to St. Louis. And I've become a big fan of it because I found out my great great aunt went to the fair and I have a small souvenir with her name on it, uh, a piece of ruby flash glass. And if you're interested in the World's Fair, uh, you probably have a few souvenirs and stuff uh, that people pick up from either family or from estate sales or uh, antique shows and stuff like that. Uh, I've become enamored with the fair. It's my passionate hobby and I'm still learning new things about it after 25 plus years of studying the fair. Uh, I like to give presentations. In fact, uh, we had a, a couple who manage a museum in Lafayette, Indiana, come through town yesterday on kind of short notice. And I spent the day with them driving around Forest Park in the rain and snow a little bit, showing them uh, all about the World's Fair. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, we had some nice uh, St. Louis barbecue too. Um, Nicole, do we have, uh, you know, your people showing up on the event and, uh, you know, a bunch of people on Facebook. Can you tell how many people we have? Just a second here on Facebook right now, we are showing uh, 21 people currently viewing. Okay. Oh, uh, that's good. Uh, hopefully uh, that's some of yours and some of ours and will grow over the next five or 10 minutes because it's just a few minutes after one o'clock. So I'm kind of uh, filling in with a little bit of time. Uh, behind me, you can see uh, a couple of curio cabinets, and they're filled with uh, a lot of uh, souvenirs from the World's Fair. That's one of my aspects of uh, my interest in the fair. And then another aspect is reading everything I can about the fair. I've got uh, a my, collection my of probably... You're Go ahead. Sharing, you're currently sharing your, your screen right now, so um, we're not seeing a video of you. We're seeing the video of your PowerPoint. Oh, Okay. I uh, got you. Uh, let me stop the uh, share. Good point. Behind me are those two cabinets, uh, and I'll aim the camera over towards the uh, closer one. I don't know that you can see uh, much that's in it uh, at this point, but uh, I filled up a couple of curio cabinets the top of my uh, piano, my mantle, and, uh, you know, just uh, all sorts of... Uh, uh, places that I can store stuff. And I also get uh, um, a lot of uh, papers that are in bins, uh, magazines and books and stuff from 1904. Uh, now we're getting back to PowerPoint. Uh, and from that, I've learned an awful lot about the fair. And the more I learn, the more I know that there's all sorts of stuff to still dig into and get into. Uh, I first did a uh, look at the Chicago World's Fair 
about 15 years ago, and I did a whole presentation comparing them in depth. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the details or a lot of those slides, but I'm going to uh, break this presentation out into two or three different parts. Uh, the first part is going to be about uh, the fields. The second part is going to talk about the Victorian World's Fairs and the Chicago World's Fair. And then about half of the presentation is going to be about the St. Louis World's Fair, because I think most of us are in and around St. Louis. So with that said, I'm going to uh, jump into my presentation and go full screen here, I hope. And you're seeing kind of a grayed out picture that uh, in the late 1800s, a lot of America's entertainment uh, of the beginning of movies in the big cities and museums and amusement parks like Coney Island was concentrated in the big cities. But circuses and Wild West shows would travel out west to smaller towns and put on a few days of shows before they packed up and went to uh, other places. But starting in about 1893 with Chicago, the Victorian World's Fairs really captured America's attention. Uh, Chicago run the right to put on the 1893 Columbian Exposition, uh, although St. Louis and New York had bid on it. And uh, after they did that, and you'll see some pictures of that, uh, St. Louis started planning so that it, by the late 1890s, they were planning for a 1903 World's Fair. And here's a list of the major world's fairs that took place in mostly Europe and the United States. Uh, you can see that Paris built one uh, in 1889, the Exposition Universal, Universal, uh, Universal Exposition, that's when they built the Eiffel Tower. Chicago in 1893, uh, celebrating Columbus in America, uh, built the Ferris wheel and got that installed. Uh, Paris had another one. Buffalo had one, uh, really emphasizing electricity, being close to Niagara Falls and all the electricity it produced. We had ours, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, and it was delayed a year to enable the states and foreign countries to build more uh, so that they could uh, just put on what was felt to be the best World's Fair ever. And that was followed by several more uh, in what was called the Victorian era. Uh, out west primarily, uh, all the way in uh, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, and San Diego. So talking about the uh, fields, and I'll have to uh, confess that I didn't know a lot about Eugene Field before I started digging into this. Uh, he was born in 1850 in the house that the Field House Museum is today on Broadway. And if you haven't been there, it's a neat place to go visit. And I'm addressing some of these remarks, of course, to the World's Fair Society people. Eugene's father was Roswell Field, a successful attorney who uh, in 1856 and 57 represented Dred Scott in federal and Supreme Court decisions, which ultimately ruled that uh, even though he had left the South, he was still a slave and needed to be returned. Turns out uh, he never was returned. Uh, there were some appeals and payments and stuff like that that took care of it. But that uh, federal law uh, didn't do a whole lot for civil rights and uh, probably hastened the Civil War. Well, Eugene's mother died in 1856 when he was about six years old. And he and his sister and uh, other kids were sent off to Massachusetts where a cousin, Mary French, raised them. He attended some college in Massachusetts and his father passed away in 1869 when Eugene was 19 years old. He attended some other colleges, but never graduated. It was noted that uh, he seemed to be more of a uh, there for a good time and a writer and just doing what he wanted to do rather than a serious student. After his father passed away a couple of years later, he received his inheritance and he decided to travel in Europe and uh, after several months in Europe, uh, he sent a telegraph back uh, that uh, he was out of money and he returned broke. Well, a couple of years bef uh, before then, uh, or I'm sorry, after then, he had traveled to meet friends and stuff. And out in St. Joseph, he met Julia Comstock at the age in 1872 when she was 14. And he fell head over heels in love with this young lady. 
Uh, he was told that he would have to wait till she was 18 before he got married. He got a job in St. Joseph working for the local newspaper, rose to the position of editor. And along the way, eventually in 1874, when she turned 16, uh, more or less, uh, they got married. Well, as editor, he started writing humorous articles for the St. Joseph Gazette, including uh, poems such as Lover's Lane. In 1876, he moved to uh, several different cities, working for several different newspapers, including St. Louis and Kansas City and Denver. In 1883, Chicago offered him a job uh, at a substantial salary uh, to write a, a regular article they called Sharps and Flats. And I think it would kind of best be qualified from the couple of articles I've read as a uh, uh, kind of an op-ed humorous thing, the kind of thing that, uh, oh, I forgot his name for the St. Louis uh, newspaper does on a regular basis, telling interesting stories about people sometimes poking a little bit of uh, political uh, darts at people and stuff like that. But he also uh, enhanced his career writing children's poetry. In fact, he wrote enough to fill up several volumes and you can see a uh, uh, illustration that was done later on for a poem he did called The Dinky Bird. And I believe one of his poems was uh, uh, Winkin, Blinkin and Nod you know, children's poem. So in about 1891, as he was doing very successful, he purchased a lot and a house in Buena Park, a Chicago suburb. Uh, 1893 was when the Columbian Exposition took place. And late 1893, he came down with a case of pneumonia and went out to California for several months, came back to Chicago in 1895, and he passed away uh, from a heart attack at the age of 45, leaving a wife and several children. In fact, uh, Julia had had eight children with Eugene, Eugene, five lived to maturity. And along the way, uh, and probably given his trip to Europe and stuff, she managed the family finances. Eugene arranged for her to receive his salaries. Following his death, she raised the children in Chicago where they were living at the time. Uh, having bought the house, etc. She also traveled on occasion. She worked with her sister to publish his works and keep his memory strong, which provided her income to finish raising her children. In 1904, she was asked to serve as a juror for the 1904 World's Fair, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. Uh, of all the tens of thousands of exhibits that came to the fair of artwork and engineering marvels of electricity and pumps and agriculture uh, implements, et cetera. All of those things were classified into 16 different departments and further into 144 groups and 807 classes for judging. In each class, they awarded grand prizes and then gold, silver, and bronze medals, similar to the ones at the bottom. Uh, women jurors were only part of the jury of each class if a woman had submitted works in that class. And there were only 35 total, and she was one of nine jurors in Group 14, the Department of Art, uh, and art in particular, art worksmanship. Uh, following that fair, there were also thousands of commemorative medals given out to people who had served on juries manage the construction effort, et cetera, and just help the Louisiana Purchase be the success it was. And a commemorative medal, uh, the triangular one in the lower right, uh, was sent to her along with a paper diploma. Well, by the 1920s, uh, more or less, she uh, had raised her children and decided to move to Wisconsin. Uh, she lived up there for about 15 years and died at the age of 80, and she was returned to the Chicago area where she was buried with Eugene. So a little bit more now about the World's Fairs. Uh, they typically were held to commemorate uh, major events. They would last typically the summer months. They were large in acreage, uh, cost a lot to get going to build the exhibit palaces. Uh, they weren't a cheap place to go. It was kind of like going to uh, 
uh, a major museum uh, in other cities besides St. Louis, or uh, let's say to an amusement park. They like to feature water uh, so that there would be boats and things. Uh, they all had statues and most of them built a permanent building. Uh, in St. Louis case, uh, of course, it became the art museum. Well, Chicago has a large museum that was built also for their World's Fair. Here's an overview picture of the Chicago World's Fair, which was held just south of the city. And I'm gonna use my mouse and hopefully you all can see my mouse. Uh, this large building in front is the Palace of Manufacturers. It was about 30 acres in size. Most of this area had been a swamp land or a mar marshy land before the World's Fair. So they had to fill it in and landscape it and make it strong enough to hold up these massive buildings. Uh, there were smaller buildings of 10 or 12 acres around their court of honor, their water feature. Uh, the uh, administration building for them, you'll see that in a moment, was built at one end and a large statue with the other. And there, in fact, there was a little place where boats could pass underneath this uh, peristyle, uh, this colonnade of columns and get into the court of honor here uh, to be seen. Uh, up in the upper right, uh, oh, uh, right here on the northern edge of this uh, lagoon that went around the Woody Island uh, is the Museum of Science and Technology that was built. Uh, a lot of state buildings and some foreign buildings were built up here on the northern end. And way up here in the distance is where their Midway Plaisance was. And you can see a little round thing sticking up there in the distance a couple miles away, and we'll get to that in a couple minutes. So here's their statue of the Republic looking across the Court of Honor at the administration building. The statue is like 45 feet tall, very large, built out of staff. All of their buildings had staff exteriors, which was plaster on either a wooden framework or a steel framework. Uh, the interesting thing about this statue, and you can kind of tell by the uh, reflection on it, the whole statue was gilded with probably, I don't know, six or eight pounds of gold, you know, gold leaf that were put on it to make it sparkle. Um, down in the distance here, as I said, is the administration building. And I'm not seeing my mouse. There it goes. Um, and there's a statue here in front of it. And there were cross lagoons on either side right in front of there that we'll see some of those in a minute. Here's a better view of the uh, administration building in the lower right here. There's a big barge with a large statue showing Columbus on it, uh, his successful return to Europe. Uh, and it was called the McMoney's Fountain. There were all sorts of fountains and statues around it. And this had to be a special day, if not opening day. Just look at the crowds that were, uh, you know, on the bridges and all the walkways. This is from the other side, uh, opposite angle. You can see the McMoney's Fountain here in the front with uh, big long oarsmen, uh, you know, fake oarsmen, all sorts of. Uh, fantasy statues around it. There's a large elk or buck. Um, you know, everyone hunted out west here back then. And I think this is the Palace of Machinery behind. And, and you can see how tall it is when you look at the people beside it. And that's one thing I love emphasizing in these presentations is when you realize how big these things were and how they built them in just a matter of a couple of years, it's no wonder that people wanted to come to these uh, wondrous world's fairs. Here's a picture of the uh, manu Palace of Manufacturers. And once again, you can see in the photograph here how the uh, uh, small the people are going into it. And this palace actually uh, was a little different from St. Louis. Not only was it 30 acres in size, about 1600 feet long or quarter of a mile, it had a balcony around the edge that was wide enough to put a, row, a couple rows of exhibits on. So they added quite a bit to their exhibit space with this uh, palace. 
Paris had a lot of common characteristics. I touched on some of them before. They were mostly funded by money from the state that they were held in. They usually had private stock sales where they would sell one share of stock for $10. If you were a little wealthier, you might buy 10 shares of stock for $100. And shares of stock enabled you to buy uh, booklets of tickets at discounted prices so you wouldn't have to pay 50 cents every time you went to the fair. Uh, in some cases, uh, depending on if you bought a lot, you'd get free tickets practically. They built large exhibit palaces for corporations and countries to put their exhibits in. Uh, the Smithsonian brought things to display, trains. Uh, you'll see pictures of the Liberty Bell. The Indians under government supervision were brought to the fairs. Uh, the United States and the various states and territories often built buildings and had promotional exhibits urging people to come to their, buy their products and come to their state. Foreign countries did a lot the same, uh, buildings and cultural exhibits and put on shows. And corporations came, uh, just like if, if you go to some of the uh, big uh, computer uh, fairs and stuff like that, uh, showing off their products of, for engines, electricity, communications, and farms and stuff like that. And they feature the new technologies like the telephone in Chicago, and the wireless telegraph in St. Louis. And starting with Chicago, they all had to have an entertainment district, an amusement park, so to speak, uh, to feature foreign lands and museums and cowboy and foreign shows and some fantasy rides uh, or rides on the Ferris wheel, of course, that George Washington Gale Ferris built for the Chicago 1893 World's Fair. So here's a picture of a launch with a boat in it. It looks like there's about 15 or 17 people in it or so in front of the uh, uh, Art Museum, Art Palace of Art, but now the Museum of Science and Technology in the Chicago World's Fair. And here's a picture of a parade of boats at the St. Louis World's Fair uh, going across the Grand Basin in front of the uh, Festival Hall. The Liberty Bell traveled to a lot of World's Fairs in the late 1800s. In fact, up until 1915, it went to a, almost every World's Fair. The Liberty Bell was treated kind of like the president or the pope or something whenever it traveled. It traveled on a special railroad car, and that car would have to stop in just about every town and be greeted and the mayor and the high school and a band would greet them and you know they'd give speeches and then send it on its way. Uh, after the trip to the West Coast to the uh, San Francisco and San Diego fairs, they discovered that the Liberty Bell had a lot of chips missing in it. People were taking little pieces of it as souvenirs. That seems uh, remarkable and amazing to me, but uh, security I guess could only be so tight. Uh, this picture of the bell arriving in St. Louis is in front of the Louisiana Purchase Monument, where those people up on the rostrum probably uh, spent 15 minutes apiece giving boring speeches. And of course, it was put on display in the Pennsylvania building for people to take pictures. And uh, even though it was you know, under guard and protected, it wasn't behind plexiglass or anything. Well, uh, the fairs both had entertainment districts in Chicago. They had the Midway Plaisance, and the Ferris wheel was right in the middle of that midway of foreign exhibits and uh, country exhibits and rides. And St. Louis had the Pike with roller coasters and museum exhibits and foreign exhibits also. And that was a place to go because those places stayed open late. Well, since the Ferris wheel was common to both uh, World's Fairs, I want to talk a little bit uh, extra about the Ferris wheel. Uh, technologically, it was probably one of the most amazing feats put together, considering it was designed essentially by one man, well, two men. One guy came up with the idea uh, and detailed a lot of it out, and then he had an engineering friend who had helped build some of New York's bridges and hired him and he got down to the nitty gritty of how they would build this. And we have a presentation that's uh, 
goes into depth of how the company and uh, the structures and the different parts of it were built and put together. But you can see that there's two large wooden towers, one on either side of the wheel. This is an end view of the wheel. And you can see that the pieces of the wheel are being put together and just extending up above where the axle is. These towers go just above where the axle is. And I think that's the axle right there at about 130 feet off the ground. You'll see some more pictures of that shortly. In fact, oh, there's the axle right there was the largest piece of forged hardened steel ever made back then. It was hollow. You can see that there's a rope that went through it, but it was made with carbonized hardened steel so that it could stand the stress. Those flanges were probably also the same material. And you can see all those holes in those two flanges that the rods would be attached to kind of like a bicycle wheel to go out to the inner and outer rings that would hold the cars. Uh, with the flanges and that axle, it weighed 70 tons, about 140,000 pounds. Pretty substantial weight to lift up to 130 feet to mount on the uh, support structures on either side. But they knew how to do that. So here's a picture of the wheel near completion in Chicago on the left with about uh, eight cars that have been put on it at that point in time. And another picture in Chicago of it in the middle of the midway with all the cars on it. Uh, each car was 13 feet wide and 26 feet long. Uh, that's the size of a small bus, but a little wider, or maybe a dining room that's longer, because most dining rooms don't get much over about uh, uh, 12 feet long and maybe 10 feet wide or something like that. If they're 12 feet wide, imagine double the width to 26 feet, uh, paste that off in your house or count ceiling tiles sometimes, and you'll be amazed at how large those 36 cars were and that each car could hold up to 60 people. Now, that doesn't mean they put 60 people in each car for every trip. Uh, I think it's rare when they put more than 20, 25, 30 people in a car and quite often, and you'll see some of the pictures of the Ferris wheel later, you'll see empty cars. So we looked at the statistics for Chicago before. Let's compare it to uh, St. Louis, uh, commemorating the Louisiana Purchase. St. Louis ran for an extra month through the month of November, uh, was about twice the size in acreage, about twice the cost to build everything, uh, didn't have as many visitors, and you can see that, uh, as I said, uh, not everybody had to pay. They either had passes or stock certificates to get them in. Uh, the statues, uh, the apotheosis of St. Louis, we still have the newer version of it and a building that was built. And then, of course, the St. Louis, I added another line last night to mention we had a special event called the 1904 Olympics, the third Olympiad that took place uh, in St. Louis. So where was the World's Fair held? Well, the St. Louisans say Forest Park. Well, that's only half right. Here's a map of the St. Louis World's Fair cropped to show just the fairgrounds. And it's also turned around so that North is at the top and the prominent uh, landmarks, the Grand Basin Art Museum, Bird Cage, and Ferris Wheel are marked on here. Now, the next slide is going to show you a map of the city and those call outs and arrows are not going to move. So there's a map of Forest Park showing the green Forest Park over to the right uh, that goes from Kings Highway out to Skinker between Oakland Avenue or Interstate 64 all the way up to Lindell. And you can see the Grand Basin and where the art museum is and the bird cage still. But from Skinker in kind of the middle uh, here, they leased land all the way out to Big Bend, almost completely. They leased Washington University, which had not yet been occupied. It had been partially built. And they leased it from the, uh, the board and Washington University decided that 
yeah, for enough money, they could stay downtown in their downtown buildings until the World's Fair was over. So they, they leased all this land to the World's Fair, which gave them a head start on building administration offices, some exhibit places. It also gave them a gymnasium and a place to hold the Olympics. Uh, a lot more land down here was used, and I'll go back and put the World's Fair map over this now so that uh, you can see where Fontbonne University and stuff are. Uh, and of course, uh, Concordia Seminary is tucked in right here also. So you can see there's uh, substantial buildings that were built, the Palace of Agriculture, the Philippine exhibit, Washington University up here, a smaller palace of uh, horticulture. And down here is where a lot of uh, livestock exhibits were built. It also gave them uh, room for a train yard and storage for all the crates that shipped all the exhibits and stuff like that. This orange area was also leased. And if you're driving on Lindell between DeBoliver and Skinker heading towards uh, Wash U, on your right, you'll see a lot of buildings, and those buildings were built on the site of the pike. There were also a lot of grandiose houses built over in this stretch on the north side of Lindell, and they were there during the fair, and I think some of them were leased by foreign countries for the duration of the fair. So having uh, looked at the fair topic, you know, on a map, let's take a, a look at it uh, pictorially. You can see Art Hill and the Grand Basin looking to the southwest here in the middle. The History Museum is right here at the site of the main entrance. You can see eight enormous uh, exhibit palaces ranging from nine to about 16 acres. That Palace of Agriculture at 20 acres is way out here. All the state buildings are in the upper left, which is the site of the St. Louis Zoo today. And if we go further to the east, you can see across Skinker right here. You can see here's Washington University, all the way out to Big Bend, the Philippine exhibit here, and there's agriculture. Enormous building efforts. Uh, there were different architectural firms that designed and uh, built all of these palaces. Uh, just think of how much lumber that went into doing that. And there had to be scaffolding on the outside of the buildings because everything got covered in staff. You can see uh, down at the bottom here, they're putting wood planking up prior to coating the outside of this with staff. You can also see the ladder that people had to climb up to build the structures, to build the roof, to build all the fantastic towers, et cetera, and a work crew that apparently is uh, maybe on a lunch break. Uh, down here is some towers, temporary towers that are being erected to help build more of this palace. Here's the uh, structures going up and you can begin to see the obelisks and globe for the Palace of Mines and Metallurgy. Uh, this looks a lot, lot like the last palace. This is the Palace of Varied Industries with what they called a flying colonnade. You can see it, uh, in here that there were columns that would be covered with staff. Most of what you see here is scaffolding. But, uh, oh, the little seven or eight-year-old boy doesn't seem too much interested in all that wood. He'd rather get into his box of Cracker Jacks. So the Chicago House Wrecking Company, after having bought the Ferris wheel, the Ferris wheel after the 1893 Chicago World's Fair uh, had to be moved because the city of Chicago wanted their park area back. So George Washington Ferris built himself a small park near Lincoln Park on the north side of Chicago, took the Ferris wheel apart and put it back together in 1894 at a new location where the Ferris wheel stood until 1903. He operated it there uh, and had a plan to build a park and make money on it and pay off some of the money that he had spent doing that. However, in 1895, three things happened to him. Uh, he got divorced, his company went into bankruptcy, 
and he died all in about a year. And so the company with this Ferris wheel on the north side continued to operate it at a loss. And by the time 1901 or two came around, they were $400,000 in debt and decided to sell the Ferris wheel. And whether somebody took it down and moved it or bought it for salvage, they didn't care. Well, a salvage company bought it uh, for $8,000. That Ferris wheel had probably cost about fifty or sixty thousand uh, dollars just in uh, the iron to build originally in 1893. Well, the salvage company I think was smart. They bought it with an eye towards another World's Fair that was coming, the Chicago House Wrecking Company, and they said, "Well, I wonder if they'd want a Ferris wheel." And they negotiated uh, some upfront money and reduced commissions and taxes on operating the wheel. Since they owned the wheel, they took it apart in Chicago. They put it on 107, all the million parts on 175 rail cars, including the axle, brought it down here to St. Louis, uh, basically over the holidays while the foundations were getting ready, and then started putting it all back together for the St. Louis World's Fair, and it opened in late May, about four weeks after opening day. These pictures were taken in St. Louis. You can see one of the cars here in front, the 16 by 26 car with its windows down to your knees, uh, plate glass windows with bars in front of them on a steel I-beam framework. They were about as safe as it could be. You can make out the uh, slanted structures, uh, the support structures. You can see the axle is in place because once the axle is up, you can start uh, hanging all the pieces. And by the way, can you see the construction workers on that? I've got about two or three pictures here. This is a uh, taken at the St. Louis World's Fair. The Ferris wheel is about uh, halfway done. And can you see the construction workers on that if you're looking real close? Well, there's one out here to the left, obviously, but uh, we'll zoom in and take a look. <coughs> and for some reason, this doesn't zoom real well right now, but these pictures are very sharp and there's about three or four people down here, two or three people up here. They're probably putting together some of this bracing support to help support all of these cranes up here that are all temporary to lift the pieces in place. Okay, uh, one more time here. Can you see uh, all the workers upper in the upper part there? I've counted at least 15 workers here. And again, uh, this is kind of blurry. Uh, I've got some sharper versions if we have time at the end to show you. And here's one that uh, I just really enjoy looking at because the, the inner wheel is completed and you can cl clearly see that there's a couple people here walking around. Uh, and oh, by the way, to get up here on this platform, uh, I always wondered how they did it, and I spent some time looking for a stairway. Turns out the stairway is basically if you take essentially a telephone pole and bolt some cross members on it to make a ladder, that's how you would get up, climbing straight up a ladder for about 130 feet to get to your work location. Uh, so here's these workers up on top of that thing lifting a piece into place to uh, get it bolted and uh, you know screwed together. Here's some people down at the bottom, uh, shows the size of the car and you can see the steel I-beam at the bottom, pinning one of the cars in place with some of these uh, pins that would go in through the outer wheel and then into the steel support of the Ferris wheel car itself. Riders in the Ferris wheel said they barely felt any movement when it started or they never felt the cars rocking. Each car, I think, weighed about 15,000 pounds. And of course, there's the wheel at St. Louis. You can actually see that uh, some of the cars over here on the right part of the wheel appear to be empty. And I think I've got another shot here where you can actually see some of the people in place. Here's the view uh, looking through the Ferris wheel at the inner wheel and across. Uh, when you get up a little bit higher, 
you'd be able to see the axle on its support and see steel girders between the inner and outer wheel. And these were two or well, two to four inch steel rods, sometimes in tandem, going into those flanges that held the inner wheel to the axle. The views from the Ferris wheel were spectacular, looking over towards Festival Hall and looking down at the Japanese garden area and the Jerusalem concession. Looking to the northwest from the wheel, you can see Washington University out here. And these are all the foreign buildings. Uh, this is all part of Washington University now, all filled in with uh, you know, their uh, various academic buildings. Off in the distance here, I don't know if it's going to come through Zoom, but you can see a little tall six or eight story octagonal building about a mile away. That's University City City Hall. Looking south along Skinker, you can see the 20 acre Palace of Agriculture and the Rose Garden. You can see the intramural railway and there's another track alongside it, which was a miniature railway, a little shuttle that ran back and forth. And so that you weren't stepping across, they actually made a walkway overpass there. Well, when the fair was over, uh, the salvage company tried to sell it and relocate it to Coney Island or to the St. Louis Highlands amusement park. And there were no takers willing to pay the fee that they wanted to take it apart and relocate it. Remember, they had already taken it apart and re-erected it in St. Louis. So they knew probably to the dollar how much that would cost and they wanted to be reimbursed for that. There were no takers, even though if so, let's say the Highlands was to pay $40,000 to relocate it and put it back up, they projected that they would recoup that money in about two years of uh, the expected attendance. Well, come May 1906, the fair was destroyed. It was on the Forest Park grounds and the contract between the Louisiana Purchase Exposition and the city that owned Forest Park said, you got to return it to being uh, our park. No, you can't leave the Ferris wheel there. And so they decided to blow it up for salvage and sell everything they could and uh, use torches to cut all those rods and beams and girders apart, put them on a train and uh, ship them off to be melted down and reused. And the question has come up through the decades since the World's Fair, what happened to the axle? That thing was 45 feet long, 32 inches in diameter. Uh, you can see from the uh, uh, carriage off to the left, or I guess that's an automobile. There's no, oh no, there is a horse in front of it. Um, you know, that you could get up pretty close to the rubble. Uh, it actually was sticking in the ground. It looks like about eight or 10 feet uh, with all the other girders and rods holding it up. Uh, the dynamite basically blew apart the support legs and the wheel just collapsed upon itself. Uh, the cars had been taken off before and they were taken apart and sold for scrap. The glass was sold to a guy, uh, believe it or not, to build a greenhouse up in Wisconsin. Uh, so what do you do with the axle? Well, the torches at the time weren't good enough to cut through it. Uh, they had a lowball offer. Uh, they knew how to move it, but the lowball offer wouldn't be uh, what they felt would be satisfactory. And so they did cost analysis. And one of our members has looked at the paperwork from the Chicago House Wrecking Company and various letters going back, uh, you know, to the 1920s up to the 1950s and 80s that the descendants of that family owned company had and have written about. Uh, the letters all said the Ferris, the axle was taken back to Chicago, that it was put in their yard of scrap. And over the course of another 13 or 15 years, by 1917 or 18, oxy acetylene torches got better and better strong enough to cut that hardened steel. And by 1919, it had been cut up for scrap. Uh, as I said, we have a presentation all about the Ferris wheel where we show some of those documents and uh, share that information. And we'll be uh, putting that out uh, through the PR channels in a little while. Well, St. Louis has always had a fascination with Ferris wheels. 
uh, after the World's Fair that continued. Of course, uh, Six Flags has one for 2004 Centennial. For, we had a temporary one put up in uh, Forest Park. City Museum put a small one on top of their building. And uh, about a year and a half ago, Union Station uh, put up a Ferris wheel at their park called the St. Louis Wheel. Uh, and I just rode it a couple of days, in fact, yesterday with the people that came through town. The cars only hold eight people and they're quite a bit smaller than St. Louis. Uh, it's only 200 feet high instead of 264 feet high, but it's still a pretty neat ride. And I'm sure most of you have driven by it at night and seen what they can do with the lights. And that inspired me to uh, put together a comparison of the two wheels of the height, the size, how many people could fit in each car, the capacity, uh, the rotation time, the lighting. And of course, computerized lighting can do amazing things. The total weight, how big the axle was, uh, the cost, and the original cost of the Ferris wheel and the cost to take a ride. It's still a pretty neat ride and gives a great view of downtown. So let's take a look uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes or so at the uh, St. Louis World's Fair in a little more detail. Here's one of the palaces in the Louisiana Purchase Monument. This is a colorized photograph. The people are to scale. It's not a drawing or anything. Uh, the apotheosis of St. Louis uh, was near the main entrance to the fair in 1904. It was made out of staff. And after the fair, uh, they had it remade as a bronze statue on a marble base. And it was placed in front of the art museum looking down Art Hill. And it's still there today. Uh, in this photograph, you're looking at Art Hill and uh, Festival Hall and the Cascades with the central waterfall. And on either side, the colonnade of states. You can see statues in front of them that represented the 14 states and territory that the Louisiana Purchase was made from. And in back here, you can just see a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of the art museum. That's how big Festival Hall was. It totally hid it. Parts of Festival Hall uh, on the dome were gilded even. Here's a closer up view of the Cascades coming down and about 30,000 gallons of water coming out of this waterfall into a pond. Uh, and then another secondary waterfall, and you could walk across below it here. And then a series of little waterfalls. There were lights below these waterfalls that would come up at night, and they would switch between white and red and green very slowly uh, so that you'd get a very colorful effect. Inside, it held the world's largest organ with 10,000 pipes. After the fair, the organ was taken apart. It had the manufacturer had gone into bankruptcy and a man named John Wanamaker bought that organ and put it in his department store in Philadelphia, which is still there today. It's been expanded from about 10,000 pipes to 28,000 pipes and still played twice a day besides special concerts. Here's a view from partway up Government Hill, which Government Drive uh, leading up to the boathouse is right here. This is about where the waterfall and fountain is looking down towards the Grand Basin. And just to give you a sense of the size, look at the people near this statue here. Look at the size of the statue. Look at the roof line up here. And then look at the statues on top. Uh, just a tremendous effort, not only to make the statues, but to put all those uh, wooden frame uh, statues together and all the columns and fancy roofs and a little statue here, a little statue there, putting that all in the place, just an unbelievable effort. Inside that Palace of Liberal Arts were a lot of uh, cultural exhibits. This is the Chinese exhibit in the Palace of Liberal Arts showing all their furniture with inlaid ivory. Palace of Transportation featured trains, the uh, major transportation method of the day. There were four miles of track inside this Palace of Transportation, uh, the only palace without columns, which was made to look like a train station with these huge 50-foot archways. 
Here's one uh, train engine that weighed 200,000 pounds. It was put on a turntable down here that pivoted. And as it got dark, they it was also elevated off the tracks and the wheels were disengaged from the engine so that the wheels would spin and look like it was moving. And when the turntable went on, the headlight would shine to the far corners of the Palace of Transportation. U.S. government had a large building partway up Government Hill. That's why it's called Government Hill. And inside, uh, the Smithsonian was a big exhibitor with a lot of stuffed animals. In the upper left up here is part of an 80-foot cast, uh, paper mache cast of a blue whale. There was also a actual battleship on display, a dinosaur skeleton, et cetera. Palace of Mines and Metallurgy featured 140-foot obelisks. And inside, as an example, the Alabama businessmen, when the state of Alabama didn't build a building, they said, well, we're going to show off our steel and iron industry. They built a 56-foot statue of Vulcan that still is in uh, Montgomery today on top of, not Montgomery, uh, capital of Alabama slipped my mind. It's on top of the mountain outside of uh, Alabama. Uh, and it has a torch, or it used to have a torch that would shine red when there was a traffic fatality that day. Birmingham, <laughs> uh, steel industry capital of uh, Alabama. Uh, Palace of Electricity, uh, of course, was uh, featured all sorts of electrical things that had been invented in the last 20 or 30 years, the uh, telephone, telegraph, uh, electric uh, machines for home appliances. Uh, Thomas Edison had a big exhibit, and in fact, uh, he helped design the lighting on the outside of it, and it was probably the most illuminated palace of all the palaces. It must have been stunning. Uh, here's a picture of the complex that was the Palace of Art. The biggest part of the building in front here, across here, is one of the temporary side annexes that was built out of brick, covered with staff, made to look like big stone. But the main Palace of Art was built out of Indiana Bedford limestone and made to be a permanent exhibit, and of course it's still there today. Uh, and here's how it looked in 1904, and the annex is down here in the distance. I was up there uh, one time and managed to stand in just about the right place and took a picture of what the art museum looks like today. And this will hopefully transmit through Zoom real close to show you the art museum looks pretty much like it did. The smokestack's gone. The alcove for a statue is now a window. We'll just go back and take a look at it in 1904 briefly. Inside the main hall, they had a lot of sculptures. The Victorians would put as many sculptures in an area and as many pictures on the wall as they could. You can see this little side alcove with just pictures uh, hanging about as close as they could place them to each other from about the height of your knees up to about eight feet high. So you'd uh, really get some neck, neck exercise looking at all the pictures. Uh, Palace of Machinery had a lot of the big engines that provided electricity for the fair. Uh, generators, dynamos, pumps, et cetera. This was the area of big heavy machinery and the steel industry was big in being able to make huge things. Missouri as the host state had the largest state exhibit uh, part, uh, at the top of Government Hill, located exactly where the World's Fair Pavilion is. The West Point cadets uh, spent the month of May here at the World's Fair, and they did their drills on a daily basis. And here they are in their uh, dress white pants and uh, dress outfits, uniforms, uh, parading, and you can see the crowd watching them. Uh, states generally built buildings from kind of small two-story buildings up to very large uh, stately buildings that featured either replicas of historic buildings in their state 
or in the case of the state of Washington, a building designed to show off their lumber industry. This building was about 100 feet tall, uh, six stories going up to an observation platform at the top, which was uh, set in the evening hours to be a nice little place to take a date and uh, uh, see if you could get cozy with her. Um, foreign countries built uh, very large buildings. Uh, this is the uh, Belgium building in front. You can see this white building and a dome in back, the Brazilian building. This Belgian building was taken apart after the fair and moved down to the uh, Anheuser-Busch Brewery and was used as their bottling plant for about 25 years before it was taken down. And I mentioned before, of course, Washington University was leased. This is, uh, you know, Brookings Hall as it appeared in 1904. There were some buildings put in front of it uh, on the sides, but it was pretty much an unobstructed view in 1904. This is a drawing of the building. Some other things that were built for the fair uh, that are still, this one is still there today, obviously. This is half of the bird cage. Along the right edge, you can see that there's a screen here to keep all these large birds in half of it. The birdcage had an arched tunnel that people would walk through. You can see the shadows of people uh, looking at these big birds. There's some flamingos and ibises and et cetera. The other side of the uh, birdcage held smaller birds that people could see, exotic ones. The Philippines were a new uh, territory of the United States uh, since uh, 1898 in the Spanish-American War. Uh, they had a 47-acre exhibit showing things off and their culture. They also, out of the 1,100 Philippines that came, brought about 100 people from various primitive tribes, including the Igorots. They would put on performances daily, and they discovered the more they would perform, they were allowed to charge 10 cents for people to come into their village area that the more they uh, put on these performances and did other things like uh, have their feast day meal of doggy stew in the case of the Igorots, the more people that would come to pay to see their exhibit and they made more money and they were able to buy things at the fair. Uh, they were not prisoners or anything. They were all volunteers and uh, came to quote, be put on exhibit for months at a time. I mentioned the Olympics of course were held. You can see uh, Francis Gymnasium in the background here, and uh, uh, you know, was held mostly on you know at Washington University, but there were other venues where the uh, swimming exhibits and diving exhibits were held. For example, in the Olympics, we, they built a huge floral clock, 115 feet in diameter. This minute hand with its counterweight weighed 2,000 pounds. And inside this pavilion at the top was a special mechanism that kept very accurate time. And every minute it would trigger a hydraulic uh, mechanism to make the wheel move one minute. Uh, some other achievements at the fair, Thomas Baldwin designed a dirigible balloon with a motor on it. I think that's Thomas Baldwin standing right here on a little sawhorse. That's the motor right there. The propeller is up front here, and here's the rudder. Uh, he was a designer, and a European had built a similar balloon and flown it for 30 minutes around the Eiffel Tower. He wanted to uh, have a comparable balloon. He en uh, enlisted Roy Nabenshoe, a bicyclist, nice, thin, young, muscular guy, to fly it, and he flew it. This picture shows him probably six or 700 feet above the fairgrounds because there's the Palace of Transportation here. That tower is about 140 feet tall. Uh, he flew this up to a reported 2,000 feet, which would have been the height of three arches. And here he is, uh, I think, getting ready to take off. Roy Nabenshoe, the uh, little skinny guy back here, He's in the rear so that it would aim upward. You can see the propeller there and the rudder in the back. To level off, he would have to walk along this little uh, erector set framework uh, more towards the middle to balance out the load and to come down. He would maybe come up here 
a little bit more towards the engine to make this thing fly down. It didn't have much in the way of altitude control. Uh, notice uh, the lack of a parachute on his back. Here's a uh, picture of the Pike, and I'm going to show you some of the Pike attractions real quick. Uh, creation took you on a fantasy ride back in time to the creation of the world. Uh, and you can tell by the people standing just how enormous it was. This was a copy of a uh, uh, ride at Coney Island. Uh, since the 1898 uh, war with Spain was over and the battles in the Philippines were fought, they created about 20 boats anywhere from 12 to 15 feet long. And a person would be inside these boats and these buildings in the back would fire puffs of smoke at the boats and the boats, the uh, armed ships would fire little flames of smoke back there and they'd recreate the Battle of Manila. Story goes at one time, one of these boats, oh, this uh, pond was only about three or four feet deep, but it was almost the size of a football field. Story goes at one time, one of the boats uh, sprang a leak and uh, as it sunk into the water, the guy had to climb out of it and everybody applauded. They thought that was part of the show. The Japanese pavilion on the pike uh, had a large gateway on it. This gateway, was taken apart after the fair and moved to the Highlands where it served as a bandstand for about 20 years before it got old and had to be replaced by a smaller bandstand at the Highlands. And there was a statue celebrating the vanishing frontier with uh, cowboys celebrating at the entrance to the pike. Well, here's a view over all of the fair taken from a captive balloon looking down at the Ferris wheel. Festival Hall here, the Art Museum and all those large palaces we've been looking at. There's transportation with the arches. Uh, here's Belgium and uh, Brazil in the background. Uh, just an incredible uh, accomplishment to build all this. And here's a then and now picture taken from the side of uh, one of the parking lots at the top of Art Hill looking across diagonally at the art museum with the fountains. You can see the fountains in 1904 were all in the curved part as opposed to being down in the straight part. But this palace was probably about the same height as these trees here. And it went all the whole length of the uh, Grand Basin, just to put things in perspective. So I like to uh, keep the memories alive. And whenever I go down to Forest Park or you know drive around, and can see the statue in the art museum. Those are remnants of the fair. The art museum is a true remnant. This is a reconstructed one, as I said. And when I took this trip, I managed to stand in just the right place and take a picture of uh, St. Louis illuminated at night. And uh, this is gonna be one of those blends. So watch real close to go back to 1904 and see what it looked like back in 1904. This subgroup of this uh, spirit, the guiding spirits of St. Louis was not reconstructed. And there's uh, information available about the uh, details on that. And we'll come back to the Grand Basin at night, watching all the lights across the Grand Basin uh, reflected in it with the lights under the waterfall coming down and on the colonnade of states going out to the restaurant pavilions on either end and say good night to the fair. So that finishes up my presentation. Uh, I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Uh, Nicole, hopefully uh, we've had uh, the attendance uh, come up a little bit and uh, you have some questions at all. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first question comes from Facebook and it is, um, were any of the workers killed during the building of the wheel, um, either in Chicago or in St. Louis? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, there were reportedly a total of nine people killed during the construction or deconstruction of the Ferris wheel between Chicago and St. Louis. 
Uh, in St. Louis, there were three reported deaths, I believe. So six must have been up in Chicago. Uh, one of them took place uh, like two or three days after the uh, wheel started uh, as a worker was greasing the axle. Uh, he took a misstep and fell. During construction, there was a newspaper report of kind of a gruesome uh, fall where a uh, uh, man had dropped probably one of the bolts or something, or a small rod maybe, I don't know, didn't say how long it was, but uh, it fell over 100 feet and struck somebody on the ground who wasn't uh, aware that there was a guy right over the top of him and made kind of a gory mess. The other workers, uh, there was no doubt he was dead, but they wanted the body removed and it took over an hour for the coroner to come and remove it. And no one was gonna touch it until the coroner got there. So unfortunately, yes, there were some deaths. I personally think it's amazing that only three people died in St. Louis putting that thing back together. And it took them, you know, two months. If you've ever seen the movie Monument to the Dream down at the Arch, my guests yesterday watched that. And he said he couldn't believe those people are up there five, 600 feet above the ground, putting that thing together. And not only did no one die, no one even fell. And yeah, they probably had straps and stuff, but no one even fell or tested the straps. They were as safe as they could be. And so uh, I think safety was emphasized as well as it could have been back in 1904. Any more questions? Uh, I'm getting started. Um, we have a lot coming in right now. Uh, the next question is, has an archeological dig ever been done in Forest Park um, to try and find remnants maybe left behind by the fair? Um, uh, let me ask you, ask you, Nicole, just to clarify a little bit. Are you talking about to find pieces of the Ferris wheel or to find just pieces of the fair? pieces of the fair in general. Okay, if you've been to the uh, History Museum exhibit in Forest Park, uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, back in the 1930s, there was a dig that took place and there's a picture online available where they've got a strip of metal that's about a couple feet long and another guy's holding a nut uh, bigger than his fist from the Ferris wheel. Uh, but you can find pieces of the fair if you walk around in certain parts of the fair and look for pieces that look like a white rock, a piece of staff. And I've done that a couple of times, like when they were reconstructing Art Hill back in 2003. I picked up uh, several pounds of staff just by walking around and kind of kicking at the dirt and finding little pieces of white rock. Uh, there are some other places uh, out in the Eisenhower woods west of the zoo that people have done some digs before and in fact if you've been to the exhibit some of the things that were found by a professor at Washington University uh, with her archaeological class doing practice archaeological digs they would find pieces of broken china souvenir china they would find pieces of staff and she tells the story that uh, one afternoon, and they were just about at quitting time, and this guy found this big white rock, you know, under the ground sticking up out of it, uh, maybe just a little bit, and he started dusting it off. And as he dusted it off, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, he realized what he's surrounded is probably about a foot wide and maybe 18 inches long, and he dusted off more and more. And they stayed around, and he pulled it up. And it's that lion's head that's on exhibit behind the plexiglass at the History Museum. They've made a resin duplicate of it for people to touch and see. And it probably, even though it's made out of staff, very lightweight, I bet you the staff one probably weighs at least 15 pounds or so. So yes, relics from the fair can be found in certain places in Forest Park. <clears throat> Um, the next question is, what is the most prevalent source for the unusual photography that you use during the presentation? Well, this presentation started out uh, 15, 18 years ago. So a lot of the pictures came from either postcards 
or pictures out of souvenir books um, from the fair, or uh, some of the souvenir books had the colorized pictures in that I, I like to use color when I can. But there's a couple, two or three sources of digital photography. Uh, the Missouri History Museum on their website has about 700 digital photos of the fair. And what's neat about those is that you can zoom into them online on your computer. There's also a story uh, of they took so many pictures that the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, which merged into the uh, Missouri Historical Society, uh, didn't know where to store them. And somehow the public library ended up with hundreds of cases of glass slides. They were negatives. And somewhere in the, I don't know, 60s or 70s, they were discovered. And finally, in the 90s, they got a grant to professionally have these crates, wooden crates, opened up. And each crate, they had probably close to 200 crates. Each crate probably held 30 or 40 glass plate negatives. They got them restored. They got them professionally digitally scanned. And they are all online. There's almost 7,000 of them. And I used many of those or some of those in my presentation, like of the Ferris wheel construction. Uh, the high, the modern high scan that they did is just truly amazing to zoom in and see those pictures uh, in detail and see the workers up close. We had another question um, that I believe was answered by someone from our group, uh, whether or not they were so it was intentional to put the um, for the buildings to be temporary and for it to be put back um, to where Horse Park was before. And um, someone answered that it was in the contract. I'm going to expand further on that. Was it the intention for the Missouri exhibit to be permanent, but <clears throat> burned down shortly before it closed? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, First, let me talk to the large exhibit palaces and the Pike and a lot of the smaller buildings, the foreign and state buildings, they all were under contract since all of that was in Forest Park that they had to be removed after the fair and it had to be restored. Now, Chicago also built most of their buildings to be temporary on a wooden or even steel framework, but then with wood and staff to make them look so ornate. And they were built up front with wood and staff because they knew they could make that uh, fast and easy. And they built the World's Fair in about a little, between two and two and a half years, everything you saw today. And it took them about two or two and a half years after the fair to take it all down and get rid of it. A few exceptions, of course, the art museum was made out of the limestone with steel framework and stuff. It took substantially longer and on a per square foot basis, it probably cost about five times as much as the exhibit palaces to make. So expense was part of the reason that they uh, built those big palaces out of wood and cheap labor because they knew they could get the wood and build it that fast and build impressive things. Now to address the Missouri building question, a lot of people think that it was built to be a permanent building because it had a gilded dome. Uh, it had some air conditioning and it had heating. Uh, it also had a uh, marble floor in some sections of it. But the uh, documentation from 1904 and the fair does clearly state that the Missouri building was a temporary building. And to just add on to that, 11 days before the fair was supposed to close, a fire started in the Missouri building and basically burned almost all the interior. They were able to salvage a lot of the valuable exhibits, including the model library, the bell from the battleship Missouri, uh, a lot of the furniture and stuff like that. And that has survived some of the furnitures on exhibit at the state capitol. Um, the Central Library, I think, has some of the books, but the interior was uh, almost burned to the ground. Some of the walls were still up, but uh, it was not built to be a permanent structure. 
Yes. Okay, so um, real quickly, we have a question from Reagan, but um, Reagan, if you're still here, I hope you might be able to clarify this a little bit. Um, so from Facebook, uh, it says, what was a hole to light postcard? Um, I'm not sure what that means. Um, Mike, I don't know if you might know what that means. Oh. Yes. Um, the Victorians got very fancy, and I don't have one of them handy. I'd have to run downstairs and grab one. Um, a hold to light postcard is two layers of cardboard, and the front layer has little cutouts on the windows. Um, in fact, uh, let me see if I can uh, go back and show you one, and I can talk a little bit better about it, because... Uh, uh, Ryan also asked, um, how is the Ferris wheel driven electric motor mounted on the axle? Uh, question. So, yeah, was it an electric motor mounted onto the axle or? Okay, I didn't quite, quite get that question, but this is a hold to light postcard where the top layer has the print and you can see the little yellow windows. Those are actually cut out. The lower layer is a thin piece of cardboard that's glued onto the front and when you hold it up to light uh those little windows uh and some of the sometimes there's a moon or a sun in the sky uh, and there's little circular cutouts down here on some of the things in front glow with yellow or red or blue so that it looks like it's illuminated in other words hold to light is the instructions and when you hold it up you see kind of a night view with lights on it. Uh, and that was a popular, slightly more expensive postcard to purchase. It probably cost two cents instead of one cent. And I missed the second question. Um, how was the Ferris wheel driven? Was it an electric motor mounted to an axle? It had a diesel, I think a diesel motor with uh, Two, there were two of them, uh, and either one of them could power the Ferris wheel. Uh, the Ferris wheel was driven by a machine that basically had a drive gear with teeth on it that, if you think of two gears with a bicycle chain around them, uh, everybody knows what a bicycle chain kind of is like, you know, with all the little segments that are hinged. And the Ferris wheel on the outside edge had teeth on it that would fit into that chain as it went by in between these two wheels. So if you turn these two wheels at the bottom, kind of like, uh, think of a tank, uh, where that the track of the tank goes across the top of the front and the rear wheel, and then the Ferris wheel's teeth on the outside edge of that big giant wheel would come around and catch that sprocket. Uh, the, there were two engines driving those gears at the bottom. There was not a chain that went all the way around the Ferris wheel, nor was it like uh, the modern one today, which basically has a rubber wheel that is kind of driving on the outside edge of the wheel. Uh, it was a gear and sprocket mechanism. Okay. Um, and we got two last questions here. Um, what was the online link uh, to view the scans glass slides? Um, I'm sorry, you were breaking up just or... a little bit. I didn't quite catch all of that. What was the online link to view the scans glass slides? What was underneath the glass slides or how did they find them or what? What, what is the online link so someone can view them? Um, well, the glass slides were taken, you know, back in 1904 by a professional photographer with one of the large you know, box cameras where they would put it in, expose it for a certain amount of time, uh, and then develop them. 
Uh, I'm not sure if that was your question, but the negatives that had been fixed and stuff or what was stored uh, either at the History Museum or the public library. And then eventually those get scanned professionally and turned into a digital image. So if someone would want to see the digital image, they would have to go to um, the public library's website? Correct. Um, and I'm going to try uh, what we did before in practice. Um, I'm going to the public library website. Uh, that's PowerPoint. That's PowerPoint. Fantastic Ferris on an iPad. While you are getting there, um, we do have a question for the Field House Museum. Uh, we do have an exhibit currently going on until July 11th of Fantastic Fairs, the Field of the Fair, here in our entryway that uh, displays some of the items and some information about Eugene and Julia Fields, the mayor of the 1893 and the 1904 World's Fairs in Chicago and St. Louis, respectively. In our cases, we have um, and books and letters, especially once inviting Julia to be a judge here at the 1904 World's Fair, and we have her jurors pen. And okay. it looks like we need to be. Nicole, here. can you tell me if you're seeing my St. Louis Public Library website, the web page now? I am seeing it. Okay, good. Um, if you go to the St. Louis Public Library, slpl.org, and go into their digital collections. And one of their large collections with a big box link is the uh, St. Louis World's Fair glass slides collection. This is one of the ones that I showed you uh, in the presentation that didn't really show the uh, construction people very well, but you'll be able to see it a lot better here, I hope. You can see the, you know, structure of the girders very well. You can see that the guy has his hat on. I'm not sure if he's got a safety belt or not, but he's, uh, you know, working on something there. Uh, you can come over here and you can see this this tower uh, going up, and back here, right where my cursor is going up and down, there's one of those ladders I was telling you about. I'm going to go look at uh, another one that uh, I showed you before. And this one has like 15 or 17 people up here in this whole crew that these are temporary cranes that lift pieces up and get them aligned so that these, these bunch of people, in fact, look at this guy up here, you know, on this curved part he's just kind of hanging on there. Uh, maybe they're getting ready to put another curved part, you know, where he's going to connect it right there or something. You can see there's a whole bunch of people down here too, getting this thing secure. And you can see the, uh, you know, construction of the uh, girders and stuff. And look at this, you can see some more ladders to get to different parts of the Ferris wheel <laughs> up here. And this is at the St. Louis Public Library, slpl.org. And once you get down to the 6,700 and whatever it is, uh, World's Fair ones, just search for the word Ferris, F-E-R-R-I-S. All right, well, I think that about wraps it up. Um, didn't see any more questions on Facebook. No. Um, so thank you for joining us today. This was a wonderful presentation and it was really great to see all the different photos and to learn so much about uh, the different fairs. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Um, and if anyone wants to see what we have going on at the Fieldhouse Museum, we are open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And
um, sorry, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, and Sundays, noon to 4. And if you can't come down in person, you can always do it. We can Zoom tour online. Uh, Mike, do you want to share anything about the World's Fair Society before we end it? Exactly. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me. I hope I uh, piqued your interest about the World's Fair for all the uh, people that are here. I suspect there's a, a pretty good handful of World's Fair Society people who probably learned a little bit more and love seeing pictures like this one that's on the screen right now. Uh, but uh, the World's Fair Society has a website, uh, 1904worldsfairsociety.org. Uh, we also have a Facebook group with over 4,000 people uh, that are posting pictures of memorabilia and information about the fair and stuff like that. Uh, the society counts about 260 members, and we mail out a monthly newsletter to everybody. Uh, we normally have meetings uh, with 60 to 80 people attending. But obviously, with COVID, we're not able to do that. So for the past few months, we've been having Zoom meetings. And this is an example kind of of a meeting. This is a special bonus one. Uh, it's you know a way we can still communicate. And when we get everybody on Zoom, uh, they can see each other and chit chat a little bit and stuff like that. But uh, uh, we have a summertime picnic. We have a banquet on December 1st, which is closing day. Uh, we have some special publications we do. We also sell some merchandise. Our merchandise is available on our website. And if you have any questions, you can uh, contact me. Uh, my email is my last name, Truax, T-R-U-A-X, at charter.net. Or you can contact us through the website also. There's a place to type in an inquiry there. And I want to thank everyone for attending and to Nicole and Kara for inviting me. Thank you, Mike, and um, thank you, everyone, and hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day.